When you hear the term happiness coach, what does that make you think of? For me, when I first heard that term, I thought it was someone that would just, you know, be sparkles and rainbows and just give you all the ways to, to kind of just, you know, be smiling all the time. In this conversation with Kim Strobel, it was really interesting to kind of unpack this and understand that, you know, this, this notion of happiness, there is something that to be said about it, but it's a journey. It's a process. And it doesn't mean that we're happy all the time. It doesn't mean that we're not depressed ever, or we don't suffer with uh, mental health struggles, anxiety, things like that. It's a process to get to. And the analogy I make in the podcast is sometimes when we look at happiness, we see it as this mountain that we get to the top of and then we plant a flag when we're there and we don't ever leave. And that's not true at all. And I really appreciate this conversation with Kim Strobel. It was interesting. It made me really reflect the, of, of the importance of gratitude, the importance of taking care of my health, how this is all tied into the work that we do in education and and honestly how it also ties into innovation because we often see innovation as something that has to do with technology something that has to do with um you know just the latest and greatest thing but it's really about people it's really about how we take care of one another how we take care of ourselves it's a really great conversation i hope you enjoy it thanks for taking the time to be here Hey everyone, this is George Kroos, another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I have Kim Strobel uh, joining me today, and Kim and I had a great conversation before this podcast, and what I was really interested in in connecting with her is that she's a happiness coach, and not only is she do that work currently, but she's also a teacher, and thinking about how stressful education has been forever, but even more so probably you know in 2020, 2021, and I thought this would be the perfect guest to have talking about some strategies, some ways that we can, you know, find that purpose, uh, find that happiness. And one of the things that I've said for, you know, I've really kind of focused on is that we've always talked about success. And I think that um, when we look at success, does that mean you're happy? But if you're happy, then I think you found success. And I think that, you know, there's different ways that can look. So Kim, uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast and just can you just tell people a little bit about well, how you're doing what you're doing today and like where you started in education and take us down that career path. Yeah, well, I always want to clarify because sometimes I think like when I'm back in the day when we used to step on stages and they would introduce us and they'd be like, she's a happiness coach. And I would have to clarify, like, this does not mean that I'm sunshine, rainbows and a unicorn. <laughs> There's a, a whole backstory, actually, to how I became a happiness coach. So, yeah, I, I taught at the fourth grade level. I became a curriculum director. And then after all of that, I became a happiness coach. But I really think that idea um, was kind of born in my soul 20 years ago. So mm -hmm. you probably don't know this about me, George, but I am someone who suffered greatly from a condition called panic disorder throughout my late teens and throughout my adulthood. So um, I am the girl who literally struggled to leave her house, walk to her mailbox, drive five minutes to the grocery store, go in the grocery store. Um, I lived in great fear. And so I always tell people, um, I started having these episodes when I was about a sophomore in high school and they just came out of nowhere. I would be sitting in class and within like a half of a second, I would feel um, my whole body would shake. The walls would feel like they were closing in. I would feel confusion. Like I knew who I was, but I didn't know who I was. Um, and I would have like these feelings of absolute terror, the most frightening experience ever. And it, back in the 90s, we didn't know a lot about anxiety disorders. So for about 10 years, um, I went undiagnosed, right? So I kept this like really shameful secret. I kept living my life, but I quit college and I went to work as a secretary and I lived under this umbrella of shame, which was like, I can't do things that normal people can do. And I don't know why, because mm -hmm. I have these episodes that keep happening. Um, and so, I mean, I literally had the bathroom moment where, you know, I laid on the floor and I really felt like every five minutes of every day was a struggle for me. Um, and I didn't know if I was mentally ill, emotionally, like I didn't know what was wrong with me. Um, and I finally ended up getting a diagnosis 
I got into therapy. Somebody said, hey, the doctor said this is an anxiety disorder. There's a name for it. It's called panic disorder with agoraphobia. And I had to really work really hard on myself so that I could, um, you know, come out of that and retrain my brain. And so at that time, I also just began reading everything I could get my hands on when mm -hmm. it came to self-help because I was really determined to do the inner work on what my issues were. Um, and so I always say like, you know, I'm the girl who struggled to walk to her mailbox. And now I'm the girl who jumps in a plane and travels across the country and steps on a stage with thousands. Like, where's the sense of humor in that, you know? Right. Um, but I think like, it's really important to understand that we all have like some type of struggle, right? We all have traumas or sufferings or injustices, things that have been really hard for us to overcome, but we do get the choice to choose if we're gonna stay like the victim of that story or if we're going to take control of our life. And so I'm really on this mission to help people know that we can have our struggles without beating ourselves up, but we can also create more of what we really love in our life. Yeah, and just like listening to you, I kind of have this visual because, you know, you you told me you're a happiness coach, right? Like that's a title that you utilize. But it doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean you're happy all the time. And I think a lot of people, when they hear that, they think there's like this happiness mountain that once you get to the top, you plant your flag and you're good, right? And I think it's a yeah. constant journey and it's a constant process. And, uh, you know, I've, you know, for years dealt with depression, anxiety, things like that. And I still struggle um, with those things. But I also, you know, have found strategies that have worked for me. But it's not like I found those strategies. They And when I say worked, I mean, you know, at certain times I know how to deal with, you know, certain anxieties uh, differently. And I think that's where some of the ownership is understanding that it is a process. It's not it's not an end point. Right. Would you say yeah, that? It's like it's a vulnerability that I know I have. And George, it doesn't mean that I did all this work and I cured myself because, right. you know, two years ago I had a relapse and I had to just reapply all my yeah. strategies or last week I had had one crazy week. So I literally walked around my desk, threw myself on the floor and let myself have a good cry. But the difference is, is that I practice happiness habits on a daily basis. So when I go in the gutter, I have a set of skills that get me out quicker than what I used to have. So you've worked in education for quite a long time, right? And yeah. I, I'm curious, I got this really strange email uh, this one time and I, I remember it pretty distinctly because I had shared some of the struggles I had with my own mental health, um, some of the things I had. Now, at the time, I was still working in a school district, right? And not only was I working in a school district, uh, my associate superintendent who I worked with very closely, who was very close to my superintendent, we had such a really good relationship and I was very honest with her. And she was super supportive, uh, pushed me into taking time off. Uh, so, wow. so she not like, like you need to get out of here, but like, no, you right. need, Just I, like need it, I need this, need a reprieve right. And I would have like, uh, I, she, she, she made me take time off for my own benefit when she knew I wouldn't do it myself, if that made sense. And I like, I'm listening to myself and I'm like, I don't want anyone thinking that I was in trouble. Right. It was, it was, uh, to help. And so she knew this and it helped tremendously. And not only like, and, um, she always treated me. Yeah. I remember actually, I remember actually that happened and I was like, I was kind of embarrassed when I came back. And they asked me to do the opening keynote for our school district, which is nobody had done that. Nobody had like, nobody in the history of our school district was asked to actually be the opening day keynote within the own school district, right? We'd always get outside presenters. So I felt very valued and you know, that they really helped me because she knew that I had strengths and I just was having a struggle. The email that I got that really I struggled with was that my, our administrators, if I ever came out with this, if I ever was open about some of my mental health struggles, um, I'd be in trouble. Is that a thing? Is that still a thing? Like this was years ago I wrote about this, but is that, is that something that you see still in schools? Do you ever hear that from educators where they're like worried about sharing that because they feel somehow, you know, it's, it's kind of like if I break my leg, 
everyone knows my leg is broken and they can see it. But if I, you know, struggle with depression and you can't see a physical ailment, then it's like some kind of, you know, different. So like, how, how have you seen that dealt with by administrators? Yeah. I think it's very double-sided, George, because I think like we have this initiative going right now, which is like, oh, we need to bring mental mental health to the forefront. Like, let's take this mm -hmm. the stigma and the label away. But then what this means is, is that we have to talk about the hard stuff and we're not really willing sometimes to talk about the hard stuff. And so I know for me personally, I really break down this whole story of you know, how I really had gotten to a point in my life where I pleaded with God to take my life. I mean, that's how much mm -hmm. suffering I was having. And I used to self check myself like, gosh, you know, it's not like everybody in the crowd has panic disorder, but every single person in the crowd has something that they have struggled with that right. they have felt great shame around. Yep. And so what I have found is when I can put a voice to this, it feels, it lets other people know you are not alone in your struggle and you're not isolated from it. And so like I coach um, a lot of schools and districts on social and emotional well-being for their educators and for their students. And I have a, an administrator right now that I'm working with and she goes, Kim, I suffered greatly from postpartum depression. And you know, with postpartum depression, you have these awful thoughts, George, like that you're really going to intentionally hurt your child. Mm -hmm. And she goes, I really wanna share that story but I'm so ashamed that I'll right. be judged that I just can't make myself do it. But she also knows that within her staff, there's a lot of mental and emotional struggles right now that people aren't talking about. Well, they're not talking about it because, you know, and I, I, I surround her with, you know, love, but she's got to bring that story to the forefront. We all have to start having these, these discussions. There are teachers that are teaching right next door to us, George, and we have no idea how much they're struggling or we're struggling and we feel like we are the only one that is enduring this. Yeah. And I remember, I actually remember when I was an administrator, um, I was pretty open with some of the things that I had struggled with. And I remember one day I had a teacher come in and she was having some very personal issues and I could, and to the point where I couldn't believe she was there. And I like just crazy things. I, I don't know. I could, I could have dealt with. And I, I just said to her like, why are you here right now? She's like, well, I'm not sick. And I said, well, but, but you're like, this is not good right now. And so what I need you to do, I need you to take the day off. And cause I'd rather have you here at a hundred percent for four days than 50% for five. And if you need more time, I got you. Don't worry about it. We'll, we will figure this out, but I need you to kind of take care of yourself. And I like, I think part of it, she felt comfortable sharing something very personal with me because I was, you know, comfortable sharing those personal elements too. And like, I've had, I've had some weird conversations in the past. Cause I'm like, you know, this is a podcast that's talking about innovation, right? And here we are talking about mental health and the thing that I've always kind of intersected is that the idea is that if you don't take care of your people, no innovation happens. If I don't think I, you got my back, I'm not going to take risks and try different things in the classroom. I'm not going to, you know, bring my best to, to work every day. And, and I think that, that, that is a very important element of, you know, this, this whole notion of the innovators mindset is about people. It's not about tech. It's not about tools. It's about how you think. And that, that takes a lot of, you know, support through that process. Um, you said this, you know, you said this, um, I read this from you is that you talked about this notion of like the conventional happiness formula is, is wrong. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by that? So there's this formula for happiness that we've all grown up with and been led to believe is the true path. And that path is, um, you know, to go to college and get a degree mm -hmm. And hopefully you choose a job where you make a lot of money um, and then you get that job and you climb the corporate ladder or you work harder and you put more hours in. So you get the recognition so you can get a promotion or you can buy the 5,000 square foot home or you can have the brand new, you know, SUV. And so you work hard, you put your head to the grindstone, you work your way up the ladder, you hopefully you create more wealth and it, with more wealth you get more things in your life. And then at the other end of that formula, 
you finally have arrived at success, right? You've gotten married, you've had the 2.5 kids, you've got the dog, you've got the nice home, you've got the nice car. And so that's the formula that we've all been fed. What we know from the last 10 to 15 years of research straight out of Harvard University, Sean Aker's work, as well as um, the University of Pennsylvania with Martin Seligman, is that that formula is actually completely backwards. We actually know that when you put your well-being at the forefront, you change every single business, education, and organizational outcome. And here's why, here's why, George. When you're talking about your, you know, you're talking about a brain, right? So we know that a positive brain is 31% more productive than a brain at negative, neutral, or stressed. And this comes straight from Sean Aker. So when we're thinking about, you know, you're wanting your people to be open-minded and ready to come up with creative solutions to their problems and expand their awareness of how they can use technology. But if the people within the building, if their brains are mostly at negative, neutral, or stressed, they're losing productivity. You know, we also know that a positive brain is going to be three times more creative, which means it's gonna be able to come up with solutions that it previously couldn't come up with because it was so overrun with the stress and the negativity. We know that a positive brain is 10 times more engaged in their job and in their life. And so this is kind of why happiness and well-being are, are coming to the forefront because Fortune 500 companies and even a lot of schools that I work with now, they're seeing the research that says, hey, when I put my employee well-being at the forefront, I actually, I actually get better more engaged, more motivated, more open-minded, more solution-oriented employees who are showing up for work and for kids, and they feel a lot better, not just in their work life, but in their home life. So what do you, what do you mean when you say the brain is it a negative? Like, what do you mean by that specifically? So like, like they have okay. negative thoughts, they're yeah. like, what, is, yeah. what does that mean? Okay. So what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to give you the happiness research first, and okay. then I'm going to explain that negativity piece. So what we know is that all of us have what's called a set baseline happiness level. So maybe my set baseline happiness level is here, George, mm -hmm. and maybe yours is here. And so what that means is you and I get a job promotion and our happiness, it does go up for a short period of right. time, or you and I get married and our happiness level goes up. But what we know is that the our happiness levels will always go right back to baseline. You know, you can go shopping, you can get a new home, you right. can get a new car, you can get married. Your happiness level goes up for a very short period of time and it always goes back to baseline. Now the brain research is really strong for the opposite. It says, guess what? You can endure really hard things in your life. Trauma, illness, COVID, loss, all of these things and that for most human beings, our brain will reset after a period of time to default. So then most people are like, okay, but where's my default? How do I know where it comes from? And so if you think of your happiness as a pie chart, what we know, George, is that 50% of your long-term happiness is genetic. So it comes from your mom or your dad or a mixture of both. And sometimes when I tell crowds this, like people hang their head and they're like, I'm so screwed. <laughs> like my mom's a negative Nelly, you know, or right. whatever, but right. there's a genetic tendency to this. We really are born with a brain that scans out and sees more good than not, or we're born with a brain that has to work at it. Mm -hmm. So is there a so way, that's only 50%. is there a way that you can, is there a way you can increase the default? Yes. And that's what we're going to talk about. So, so 50% of your long-term happiness is genetic. Now here's the next kind of staggering figure from, and this is all from Sonia Lubomirsky, mm. but the staggering piece of the pie, George, is that only about 10% of your long-term happiness comes from your external circumstances. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by an external circumstance? I mean, if you're married, divorced, single, or widowed, if you have kids, if you don't have kids, if you live in a 1,000 square foot home or a 5,000 square foot home, if you make 75K a year or 1 million a year, if you need to lose five pounds or 50 pounds, believe it or not, all of those things are external factors and they really only contribute about 10%. The problem is, is that you and I and everybody else, 
we let it eat up way more of that pie. Mm -hmm. In fact, we're all chasing the 10%, right? Because we all play that game that says, well, if I could find the right partner, I'd be happy. If I could just get this job promotion, mm -hmm. or if I could make more money, or if I could switch careers, or if I could get the bigger home, I'll be happy. But that doesn't eat up. That That's only 10%, but we all put our eggs in that basket. So how do we raise the default then? Where is, how do we do that? Okay. Well, first of all, George, I do have to tell you this, because you just told me you have a two-year-old and a six-month-old, right? Uh, nope. I have a four, close, a four months, four years, four and a half years, and about seven months. Seven months. Okay. Yeah. So the happiness research also says, now get ready for this, George. When you become a parent, mm -hmm. you become a little less happy for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good to know. And here's why, George. You have more meaning in your life. You have more purpose. But let's be real honest. You're going to be stressed out forever. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so that leaves 40% of the pie. And that's the part that I get most excited about. Regardless of our genetics, regardless of our external circumstances, right. you and I all have the ability to increase our happiness levels by up to 40%. And that 40% encompasses three things, your actions, your behaviors, and your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So I would like to give you a happiness habit that is going to help you raise your 40% and it has to do exactly with your thoughts. Are you ready? Go for it. I want, I want to know what this is. Okay, so the average human being has about 70,000 thoughts a day. Okay. The average human being, for the average human being, about 80% of those thoughts are negative, mm -hmm. which means when you and I put our head down on the pillow at night, we both had about 56,000 negative thoughts. I have, I have most of my negative thoughts when I sleep. I don't know why. <laughs> I yeah, honestly do. That's really I, bad. That's going into your subconscious mind, yeah, George. That's not good. <laughs> so what we also know is that 95% of the 80% of negative thoughts are the exact same thoughts you had the day before. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason being is that we have this crazy little part of our brain called the amygdala. And back in archaic times, the amygdala kept us safe. Its number one job was to scan its environment right. and look for everything negative. So it's not our fault. Our brains are just like this. Our brains are constantly scanning for negative. But I'm going to give you one of the top five happiness habits that will actually change your brain. And it's this super simple two-minute daily habit that will have an entire ripple effect in your life. And it's simply called gratitude. Here's what we know. If you literally write down, and you do have to put pen to paper, if you write down just three different things every single day that you're thankful for, for the next 21 days, we actually create a new neural feedback loop in your brain. And that means that the lens through which you're starting to view your world begins to change mm -hmm. because you're flooding the mind with noticing all that's right versus all that's wrong. You're still going to see the things that are wrong. But what we know is this actually goes in and changes the brain chemistry and the new neural feedback loop that's created. So, for example, your brain yeah. has like thousands and thousands of roads. So if you tell me, George, that, that there's this thought that you know you have all the time, whatever that right. thought is, that's that's a road that you're constantly traveling. Right. And mm -hmm. the more George travels that thought process, the deeper that road goes, right. which means his brain just wants to go down that over and over and over again. But we get you out of that loop when we create a gratitude practice, which I tell teachers, like I did this with my students. You know, every morning we started out with 90 seconds of gratitude. We went around the room. Everybody said one thing they're grateful for. At the end of the day, we pulled our gratitude journals out. We wrote the date. We wrote three things we were thankful for. So it's actually, I've actually been focusing on gratitude for a while. And I remember, Pat, you? yeah, I'm not, I'm not there where I'm writing three stuff writing three things down a day, but yeah. I have been trying to be more mindful and thoughtful of that. And I remember, uh, Patrick Larkin, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a very good friend of mine and he wrote a blog post when COVID happened and it was really interesting. He said, what are you, because he's been focusing on gratitude for a long time as well. And he said, what are you thankful for that 
you like what are you grateful for that you have because of what the situation has done and i i found it i remember i've talked about this quite a bit is that i found it kind of selfish when i first read it like how could i be grateful people are literally dying this is like a horrible thing that the world is going through thinking about the repercussions and what i had found is that i then did start to think about how you know you and i both travel quite a bit i i you know we both stopped significantly if not totally uh, because of COVID. And that was like a concern, you know, for the work that I do. But I started thinking about how grateful I was that my daughter Kalia um, would, I'd ask her, like, what was your best part of your day? And she'd say daddy home, like every day. Mm-hmm. And then what happened was interesting is that I actually, once I started thinking about that, it actually helped me to help other people. I don't know if that makes sense right? It helped in that process. And so at first, what I thought was really selfish, um, kind of was turned into be quite selfless, right? Is like saying like, Hey, I want to focus on the good things I have, which will make me help others through their struggles, not become so centered on what I don't have, what I don't appreciate at this time. And that, that I I felt that was, um, really helpful. And, you know, Patrick is someone that, uh, I really look to, and I'm curious at your thoughts on this question. Uh, I like reading his stuff because I find him to be very uplifting and I'm very cognizant of what uh, I consume. I'm very cognizant mm-hmm. of who I surround myself with. And I've felt like I've, I've been more thoughtful of those things the last while. And I don't know if you know about this, about me, but like right now I'm on a, a weight loss journey. Uh, I've lost as of today, about 65 pounds and I think, and like, yeah, like I'm eating better. I've always worked out. So like those two things, but I, I have really focused on, I think the biggest things for me, other than those maybe two factors is really being thoughtful. And, um, sometimes like I, I think social media is a really powerful tool and can do a lot of good, but I've also see a lot of like, it, it does instill a lot of those negative thoughts, you know? Um, is there any like correlation between that and, um, you know, yeah. happiness? Absolutely. So, I mean, first of all, George, I think like, you know, that, that saying, like you're the average of the five people that right. you spend the most time with. Right. And so, um, I think we definitely need to filter like if like the news, I can only stand a teeny tiny bit of it. I don't even watch it every day. Mm-hmm. Cause man, it, my, my whole stress level just climbs when I'm listening to the news. And so like, right. I don't want to feed my brain or my, my, my energy that. And so I'm really careful like you are of what I allow in. Um, and so honestly, just to be real frank with you, that, that means I've had to shift some relationships in my life because, um, you know, I, I can't absorb that. We all have times when we feel negative or down or stressed or whatever, like we're just human beings, but I really love what you said. It, which I think it reminds me of Brene Brown's work. So we do this thing called comparative suffering when we say like, hey, if somebody is suffering more than me, then like I'm not allowed to say I'm suffering or I'm not allowed to feel good. And so what you're saying is like, you're not denying that a lot of people mm-hmm. have had tremendous losses this year, but why why can't you take control of your energy field? Like that is a gift to the world when you do that because you show up as a better husband you show up as a better father you show up as a better leader right yeah and i i I think like i said that that is that is a huge thing for me is is to really try to help other people like i've i've had more conversations i've been able to mentor more um over this past time and you know my time the way i you know have used my time in the past but those are things that I think are really important to me. And when I look at, um, in those spaces, like when you say about the news, it's, it's interesting in the sense that the, 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 the outrageous, the, the fear stuff, uh, like 24 seven CNN t- type thing is meant like they, they are business. Right. Yeah. And so I think people like, I am very aware that it is meant to like, the world is ending 24 seven because that makes people watch. Right. And I'm not like saying, don't watch CNN or anything like that, but it's yeah, just, we want you to be abreast of current events, 100%. but you also can monitor what you're letting seep in, totally. you know? Totally. Yeah. And I, 
I, I actually found like I, so that being said, I watch a lot of TV. What <laughs> I like TV. I find it interesting, but I like, uh, it's like, I know COVID's going on. Right. And so if I turn on a basketball game, it's like COVID, 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 COVID. I'm like, I like, I'm, you know, like I, this, like, so I started watching a lot of movies and stuff like that because I noticed that I'm like, I know, I know these things are going on. Right. And I'm, I'm trying sometimes to take a step back and sometimes the media, right. Like I've actually, um, and like you said, it's not that I'm not aware cause you can get it. I can like, I actually remember, um, when I was a kid, the, and I remember like some really tragic events where it, and that's a really big tragic events as a first year, like starting my first year teaching, uh, as a kid, like I remember the challenger, uh, disaster. I remember that very vividly. I think I was in grade two or three at that time or something like that. And it was like, actually the yeah. day my grandma died, it was like, I remember that vividly. Uh, I obviously remember nine 11, but I remember, so I know this is weird, but we all went to a library. And there was like a TV on a cart, right? And and then like thinking about when 9-11 happened, I was the technology teacher and we went to the library to the TV, right? Like we never even thought like, hey, let's see what's going on online. Let's see what's going on, on social media. And so now, like there's nowhere that I couldn't get away from that information. And I wonder what that does to you, right? Like I wouldn't, if something was going on, I would go to my phone right away. That's in my pocket, wherever I am. Right. And I can go see on Twitter, YouTube, blah, 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 everywhere. Like, and like, even if I'm not looking for it, it's going to pop up in notifications. And I, I wonder like how much stress that does because there was like a place you went to as a community to deal with some of those things. Cause it wasn't like you were there by yourself. You were with other students, you were with other teachers, but now a lot of this is like, no matter where we go, it's, it's, it's following us. Yeah. And I think like the, the same is true of like social media, right? Like if I, you know, see a mother out there who's like doing this great stuff with, with her kid and I'm like feeling less than as a mother, or if I see like, Oh wow, George is out there and he's had a hundred keynotes this year or whatever. And I've had 50 mm -hmm. and I'm like, Oh, I'm just not as good as George. Like, I wish I, you know, like it's so easy to feel like we're not enough when we look at social media because people are just putting their best self out there. Yep. And so like, I've had to even monitor some of that, right? Like I just have to play the game of Kim Strobel. Like I use people like you, George, for you, like, you know, you raise the ceiling on what I think is possible for my life because like you, you are out there, but I don't see you as like, oh, I, I'm not enough necessarily. It's more like, hey, I, I'm i inspired by you. I, I'm ready to show up more, but I think it's really easy for us to get in that trap of comparing ourselves to others and social media does a really good job of that, especially, I don't wanna be like gender biased, but I think like women really struggle with it, right? It's like. If I do a post, because I run 40 miles a week, right? Mm. So I'm like, oh, hey, I just did my 10 mile run. There's a lot of women who are going, wow, like I just wish I could run 10 miles a week. I, I could never do what she does. And it's not about that, right? It's like being able to get inspired by others, but also being able to walk your walk and do your journey, which I think is a, kind of what you've been doing with your your health loss, loss. I mean, one of the other top five happiness habits, George, is move your body. That's one of the right. top five. I mean, gratitude's in there and move so your body. Two five. A day. I'm doing two of five. You're already. two of five. And here's the other, George. The other is social connections, right? right? So like having great relationships in your life. So there you totally. go. Yeah. That's number three. The fourth one is a meditation practice because we know that changes the brain. And the fifth one is random acts of kindness, which is what you kind of talked about. Like you feel like mm -hmm. you're able to give more of your true self to people this year because you're actually available. You have the mental capacity to be there more for people. Yeah. And here I'm going to give you, I'm going to give people a tip on social media that I use. Okay. And there's actually two things I want to talk about. The, the first one is social media is ESPN sports center. It's not the whole game. It's the highlights, right? Oh, that's so and, good, yes. And I think, I think people just need to understand that. So I really, when I talk to this, like, oh, I hate people posting all this positive stuff because it makes me feel bad, right? Well, first of all, I don't, you know, I, I choose to share, like, there's always other people, like, you know, involved in my life. And so I don't, you know, I'm thoughtful of, like, I can't believe my brother and I got in a fight because that, 
you know, like that's something I don't think is anyone's business nor, you know, there's always like a perspective there too. So I share things I share when I struggle sometimes, but there's a lot of things in my life that are negative that I struggle with that I don't share because, right. right. So just, so I think part of it too, is that we sometimes get mad at other people because their life is going well. And it's really, you have to understand how you consume it. You have to understand that because you can't control what other people consume. And, and ultimately if you can't handle what they're consuming and maybe like you're annoyed, but mute, like mute, do whatever. Right. It's, it's not, there's no requirement where you have to be on uh, those spaces. Um, this like people know me like, Oh, George is on social media, blah, blah, blah. All the time. I have zero notifications. I go to my phone. Every my phone is on. Do Me not, too, George, because is, I can't handle this. Yeah, my phone is on Do Not Disturb twenty four seven. And why? Wow. And I actually just got an email from a teacher saying like we need to be able to walk away and step away from our phones and stuff like that. So why I do that? And I think this is really important advice. The phone never draws me to it. I go to it when I feel like it. So there's mm-hmm. no point where my phone. I know this sounds horrible. I don't even have my ringer on. I know this even sounds worse. I don't have voicemail and act activated on my phone because I, <laughs> I don't, I I'm like, you know, okay. But I want to know this system here, George, because I'm not going to lie. I feel very addicted to like checking my emails and my phone is like, I'm, I'm good about limiting my time yeah. because I don't want to spend like hours and hours doing yeah. social media. But that being said, I'm going to fully admit, I think I have a little bit of an addiction problem and I want yeah. to know how you do that. So lay that out for me. Like, do you, oh, are boy. you telling me that you know. say like three times a day, you'll go take your do not disturb off and see if you missed any okay. calls or messages? So, okay. So here's a good example. Okay. So I, I don't think I have the, like, I'm not the epitome of happiness. <laughs> so I don't want to, I don't want people like, Wow. So I don't want anyone like pointing at my <laughs> strategies. I'm sharing what works for me. So you take whatever you like. So here's, here's a, here's a really good example. Okay. Um, when I, so I've like, I've, I've lost, I've lost 65 pounds that I put on slowly over the last few years. Right. And you know how traveling can, you know, lends to really bad habits cause you're eating at restaurants all the time. Uh, root, lack of routine, etc. Um, but one of the things that I've struggled with is first thing in the morning, checking my phone, right? And you check your phone and you're like, okay, I'm going to work out in the morning, right? I'm just going to look for Twitter for like five minutes. I'm just going to five minutes, right? Yes. And then five minutes and then two hours later, you miss your workout or you're, or you see something snarky and blah, blah, blah. It ruins your mood things like that. So I don't look at that. And what I find is that after I work out, if I look, look at the phone after I'm better prepared to deal with it, I'm better prepared to deal with those things. So I also have levels of things. So for example, Twitter to me is optional. Like I like using it, but there's no day where I feel like I have to be on Twitter. None email to me. I have to do because of just because of the work that I do. So, um, I'm thoughtful of that. And so I, you know, like, here's what's necessary that I have to take care of. And, uh, here's what's optional. And I think part of it too, is that people feel like I have to be doing this on Twitter. I have to do this stuff. And I think that for me was like that, that has really helped me throughout the day. And for me, and this again, do not point to me as the epitome of happiness, right? I'm not, you know, I struggle with stuff too. Um, I am, when I work out in the morning, I am so much better the rest of the day. I am so much mm-hmm. better the rest of the day. And I don't know where that, you know, I don't know what, you know, if that moves it up to like four a for being good, uh, if you do in the morning, if you work on the morning, but like little things like that are really intentional, but I'll t- like, I I'll tell you, and I'll say this again, I do not let my phone bring me to it. I don't, I go to it when I feel that I in the the capacity to go to that space. Others are so addicted. I shouldn't say, I don't want to say addicted because I'm not judging anybody. Others are so drawn to their phone because of notifications, which is the intent, right? Like that, the intent, like if you look at Instagram stories, they're only there for 24 hours. Why are they only for 24 hours? Because they want to give you that, that notion of FOMO that I have to keep looking at what people are doing because it's going to be gone. And if I don't see it, then I'm going to be left out. 
I don't really care. Like I just, it's not my yeah. thing. And so I think you have to kind of find that space of like, like who's in charge. You are the phone. Yeah. Right? And the reason you're successful at that, George, is a concept that we call engineering your environment. Right. right. So like you, you wouldn't be successful if you didn't create an environment where that makes it the least you know, like the easiest thing for you to do because you have notifications turned off. So you've oh, already turned off one of the triggers that's going to give you the motivation, like to pick that phone up and hit that notification. I have a little bit of OCD going on, so I can't handle seeing any notifications on my phone. They're all turned off. Right. I do not want to see little red things. They trigger me. Um, so that's great. But yeah, it's engineering and environment. It's not that people don't have willpower. People are always like, oh, I just don't have willpower to exercise mm -hmm. or I don't have mm -hmm. willpower to do my gratitude list or um, to stay away from my phone. It's not willpower. That's the problem. It's that you haven't engineered an environment that sets you up for success. Yeah. And I think it's, it's priority, right? It's like saying I'm always late. And I say, well, you know, there's a, I think it's Eric Thomas. He's a speaker and he said, okay, so if you're always late, let's say tomorrow morning, you have to be at this place by 5.00 AM and I'll give you a million dollars. Would you show up on time? They're like, I'll be there at 4.55. Well, then it's not you yep. can't be late. It's that you don't see it as a priority. And I just remember exactly. that because that, that to me was like a was like a really good analogy because it's like for me when <laughs> people are late for me and on time for others, that tells me something, right? Yes. And yes. so um, all, you know. you're exactly right. It's all about priorities. I mean, yeah. you know, I always tell people like I, I'm not this like shining, you know, I, I am happy a lot of the time. I mean, anybody who's around me would say like Kim has this contagious, you know, enthusiasm for life. And I do, George, because I, I think like, let's be honest, you know, the last time you walked out of Target or Walmart, you, you literally didn't like look up in the sky and be like, oh, thanks. That was really easy. But, right. but Kim struggle does that because that was something that was hard at one time in my life. And so, you know. I have these routines. I mean, every morning I get up, I write my gratitudes. I take my run. I write my affirmations. I do try to meditate. Like I do have habits that are a part of my daily life that set me up so that when I do fall off the bandwagon, which my husband would say, you know, right. look, there's several times Kim's like lost her damn mind or whatever. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I can actually get myself out quicker at times than I used to. Yeah. It, yeah, that's, you know, that, that to me, I think the habits, um, is really important to me. And I also think long and short-term goals, like figuring out what are yeah. you trying to accomplish in the short term? What is where you're going? I, I, I always give the analogy, um, when I run hills, if I look at the top of the hill, I want to quit because it seems so far away. If I look two steps in front of me and focus on that, I tend to like have no problem with those two steps. And then I thought for those two steps and eventually you're at the top of that hill. And I think, you know, having that process of kind of one foot after the other is important. Um, yeah. You know, George, it's not that we have to make these like major leaps in our life. Right. That's what people think, but it's actually a million teeny tiny little steps that act as combined interest in our life. When you wrote innovators mindset, George, you didn't start out with the whatever 26 chapters you started out with, with words and then a chapter and then another chapter and then another chapter and eventually it became a book and it's the same thing in our life we just have to pick one teeny tiny little thing right. to do and then we move the needle in our life and if you keep moving the needle mm -hmm. it, it does it, it works like combined interest if you know anything about finances and banking right it's like all of right. a sudden if you've done uh -huh. this then maybe when you retire you have a million dollars in your account but it started with the first dollar right well, this actually le leads into another topic that you, you share this, you, you shared this idea of this arena of bigness. How does that yeah. relate to this? Like, what, what does that mean? How, how do you get to that? Like, what is the arena of bigness? What does that mean? So I call the arena of bigness being willing to do hard things in your life. Like, we can all stay safe on our lily pad. We can try nothing new. We can teach the way we've always taught or, you know, do, do nothing that kind of moves the needle. We can stay safe on our lily pad or we can feel the fear and do it anyway, right? So for me, stepping into the arena of bigness means I'm going to try something different and I might fail. Or it might mean I'm going to have a conversation with my spouse to let him or her know more of what I need in this relationship. 
or um, I'm going to follow my passion and my inner strength and I'm going to launch my side business, even though I don't have it all figured out yet, right. or I'm going to put pen to paper and I'm going to write the first chapter of my book. So for me, the arena of bigness means you feel the fear, you allow yourself to get comfortable, and then you do it anyway, because that's how we grow. Right. Like we only grow like it's like a caterpillar. Right. Like, have you ever seen a caterpillar try to emerge from a cocoon for 14 days or whatever? I mean, we used to do this in my fourth grade classroom. It's like painful. Right. Like like the caterpillar is just trying so hard and it's making like zero headway. And you so badly want to clip the ends of the cocoon. You want to free the caterpillar. But the caterpillar can only be born if, if it if it strengthens its wings mm -hmm. in the cocoon. So it's that idea of productive struggle that we teach, George. So like we have to allow ourselves to productively struggle because every time we allow ourselves to do that, we do become a better version of ourselves. but it doesn't mean it's easy. We, we don't, right? we don't, we don't have caterpillars in Canada. You don't? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you have ticks too. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, you know, I think, um, one of the things that has helped me along in my career and is, and I think is that I don't overthink. I know that's a weird process. You know, I get an idea and I just see, I just see where it goes. And I think a lot of people are so nervous about what if this fails? What if this, and the, I don't, I don't, I don't even really, I don't, I know I, I shouldn't say I don't worry about that. Like, I don't want to be a failure. I don't want to fail at things that I do. I, I think one of the benefits of being a, an educator, being a teacher is that we are in the, the business of learning. So I don't see it as like, well, what if I go in this venture? It's like, no, I, I, I want to figure this out. So I'm going to jump in because that's the best way to understand it. And then sometimes like you mentioned innovators mindset and I appreciate that. I never had the intent of writing a book. I wanted to start blogging and I wanted to make a portfolio. So I just started it one day and eventually, you know, writing, you know, day after day after day, then I was like, ah, maybe I'll try a book. And then I started writing the book, but it's so like, I think part of it too, is that we're so, um, nobody wants to be, fail. Nobody wants that. But in education, I think we have the benefit of, Hey, we're learners. So don't worry about failure. Just are you learning? Right. And I think a lot of times it's, it's funny because I think overthinking can lead to a lack of learning, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think like, can we just learn that we can put our stuff out there imperfectly and it's still going to be better than not doing it at all? Right. I mean, we have this thing, George, where, I mean, it's really a fixed mindset, right? Because I teach about fixed mindset yep. and growth mindset in my business. And so we we have this thing, like we have to have it all figured out before we can do it. And, 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 and or we say, I'll wait till I feel good enough or mm -hmm. safe enough to do it. And you're never going to, you have to know you're going to feel uncomfortable, but you just have to do it anyway. I mean, I always tell people when I created my 90 day coaching program for women, it was in the fall of 2018, George, and I was having the worst relapse of panic disorder in yeah. 20 years. Okay. And I was like, who am I? I am creating the 90 day happiness course. And I'm like the most miserable I've been in 20 years, but guess what? I was exactly the person to be mm -hmm. creating that course. And so we have to kind of get over ourselves and right. we have to just be willing to say, Hey, I'm going to move forward, even though it's going to be a cluster. I'm, it's better than not moving forward at all. Yeah. And you know, it doesn't mean you're not going to get criticism. I actually remember I, I wrote a blog post and I, I like to write, um, to learn not there's, there's a difference between. So I always, there's a distinction for me. Sometimes I write to share my learning and sometimes I write to learn in the sense that it's me just getting my thoughts out there and putting in that space, you know, and I said, you know, this blog is me writing to learn. So just bear with me. And I wrote the, the word bear, B-A-R-E, right? Yes. yes. And someone wrote me the snarkiest email and they're like, I don't want to listen to anyone that doesn't know the difference. And, I, and it's like B E. E A R. And it should be bear with me. I'm like, uh, uh, first of all, that you know, whatever. That seems stupid. It's it's correct, but it doesn't make any sense that you know, bear like a bear with me. So I whatever, and you know, it wasn't like an intentional mistake. But they totally disregarded everything that I said because of the one spelling mistake, right? Yeah. And at the end of the day, I, I remember. I it's funny because I still write bear with me. And I write it that way that they taught me. 
in the in the the worst way and i always think of that email but that i don't i think a lot of times we get really worked up of people who don't want to learn from us anyway like if that really was the set off you probably yeah. you probably aren't really interested in what i have to share if that if that was like it then i'm not for you right then i'm not for you but there's a bunch of people who uh either also didn't know that or they they saw something you know that they didn't care and i think i think part of it too is understanding if you ever did that to my kid and you discourage them from writing and taking away their oh. voice as a teacher i'd be destroyed i'd be so upset yeah. that if you said you better don't put anything out there unless it's perfect if you no, i no teacher would ever be saying that to a kid and no. I, I think about yeah. that too but but always look at for me i always look at who's cheering for me who who's I'm not saying like a lot of people are like, Oh, you don't like criticism. I'm fine with criticism. As long as I know you got my back. If you're criticizing me because yeah. you're jealous because you feel that somehow, um, you know, like, and I'm not saying all criticism comes from jealousy, but a lot of it does. And a lot of people can't, a lot of, a lot of people can't admit that. And so yeah. p- the people that are, you know, as you say, you know, going into that arena of bigness, you'll, you'll have people that criticize you, but take it, take a step back. And as you said, you know, is it better to have nothing, out there because i would say no and just look like is that person going to be cheering for you anyway because because i've also had i've also had dms that like hey george you spelled that wrong just want to give you a heads up those people are, those I people got my that. back those people got my back right they don't say like i don't yeah, I, can't, I won't listen to you. Thing, george yeah. is like when we're educators we're supposed to be perfect like i'm a teacher so i'm yeah. here's the thing about kim strobel my zone of genius is that i'm a quick start I like take action immediately. I'm a big implementer, but I'm not someone who pays attention to details. Therefore I have somebody on my team because that's, but that doesn't mean I wasn't a great teacher because I misspelled a word and I typed too fast in a post. And it really goes to Teddy Roosevelt's um, man in the arena quote. Do you know that? Yep. Yeah. Right. So it's not the critic who counts, right? It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better, the credit belongs to the man who's in the arena, whose blood and sweat is marred by dust. And so like for me, that I'm rooting for the people who are like willing to go in and willing to fail because their criticism matters. But when you're not in the arena with me, Mm -hmm. when you're not doing big, strong, scary things in your life, you have no place to criticize me and mine. So like that, that critic doesn't count. You know what critic counts? If you come to me, George, and you're like, hey, Kim, I love what you're doing, but I kind of wish that maybe you would have not gone down this road. And I'm just telling you this from a professional standpoint. I'm going to let, like, that's good feedback, right? Yep. That's somebody who's really out for my good and not to be like, shame on you, Kim. Mm-hmm. And so there's a difference. And when people are attacking us, and teachers get this all of the time, I feel like teachers are so attacked a lot of the time. Yep. You really have to self check. Is this, coming from someone like you said, George, I, I don't think I've ever heard it said better. Is this coming from someone who has your back yeah. or not? Yeah. Well, Kim, I, I, uh, I felt like this is a little bit a therapy session that I wasn't ready for. And, uh, I felt we talked about some like really depressing topics, even though I was like thinking it was just going to be like sparkles and rainbows the whole time. And I think that, that, you know, reminded me of when we talked at the beginning, this is a journey, this is a process, right? It's not, a linear line. And so I just want to thank you for the time. I know people that listen to this are going to get a lot out of it. Uh, I feel like I actually got a lot out of it too. So, uh, I don't know if I'm going to cry after this a little bit, you know, (laughs) but I, I feel, I, I I, I feel better. I I feel better. I think, you know, I, you know, I've, I have a lot to think about and I, I, I always think about this stuff. Um, it's this weird thing that I kind of feel like I used to always think about this stuff more as an educator than a dad. And now I'm thinking about this more as a dad than an educator, right? Like some of the stuff that you said. So I just want to thank you for your time. I thank everyone for listening. Kim, it was great to have you. So thanks for, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks George. It's my honor. Okay. Bye everybody.